Okay, we're broadcasting and waiting for folks to roll in. We'll get started in just a few minutes here. Hi there, welcome to our program. Hey, Aaron, we'll get started shortly. Okay. I'm gonna wait like 30 more seconds. Great, so I'm gonna get started. Um, hi everybody, welcome to today's Digital Access for the Arts program, protecting content online, legally and secure. Um, my name is Adam Desjardins. I'm the programs manager at Culture Source. Um, for those of you who might not know about Culture Source, so this is your first time you know, joining us for a Culture Source program, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Um, we are, Culture Source is a regional arts service organization. We work to serve the seven counties of southeastern Michigan and all of the arts and cultural activity and organizations within those counties. Um, we do this work through three different pillars. Um, we do it through programs and convenings, which normally are in person, but we have, you know, shifted to virtual. Um, we also do this work through funding opportunities. We regrant um, funding from both, you know, federal and statewide organizations, but then also from foundations um, from throughout the region. Um, and we also do this work through research, which is a new wing of our work um, to better understand the needs and address um, the opportunities for um, supporting arts and cultural organizations. Um, in their needs and what, what needs to be addressed. Um, so essentially we are um, here today for our Digital Access to Arts program. This is a pretty big program that we've launched um, this past year um, that is slowly wrapping up as we reach May. Um, the whole program is four parts. Um, the first part, which you're here at, is um, one of our seven part online programs. Um, this, these feature you know, local, national, and international um, presenters and speakers and also um you know we've paired them with how to focus hack sessions which are 30 minute you know tactile tactical um programs to really learn you know some sort of how to content this program specifically will be followed by a hack session as well um i'll be sure to share that out shortly um also we a part another part of our program is the tech expert in residence opportunity this is a really great um new program service for us which is providing one-on-one -on -one support for um, arts organizations in their digital strategy, ideation, and innovation. Um, John Riley, who is our tech expert in residence, is doing a really great job um, you know, helping folks assess where they're at and their capacity and infrastructure for um, tech in, in, as it relates to technology and you know, where they you know, want to go and aspirationally you know, can go, but then also what capacity they have to, um, to get there. So yeah, please sign up for a meeting with John Riley today, our tech expert in residence, he's really great. Um, and then just closes our research with Eight Bridges Workshop. They have been assessing current digital and online capacities of Culture Source members um, to better understand how to support the sector. They're also known for their research um, that they did with the National Endowment for the Arts, which was all about um, arts and the intersection of arts and technology and where artists are working um, and how to support them, um, either through funding or through programs. Um, so they've been really close to the arts and tech space and we're really excited um, to learn from their research that they just closed. Um, and then the announcements co are coming soon for our funding program um, in which we're making 16 $5,000 grants to culture source member organizations to make investments in sustainable technologies that enhance their digital and online work. Um, really excited about this. Um, and you know there were lots of really amazing applications. So hopefully um, we will be announcing that soon. Um, all of this was not created in a vacuum. This was all in partnership with Rocket Community Fund, specifically the community sponsorships team um, there, Jasmine and Leah. Um, huge shout out to them and um, thank you for their support um, in this whole program series and the Digital Access to the Arts program as a whole. Um, some upcoming programs um, to make note of. 
Um, immediately following this program, we will be doing our hack session um, with Mark Majewski from uh, Rock Central. He will be leading us on um, a deeper dive into cybersecurity. Um, uh, and he created this amazing title called Not For Profit Does Not Mean Not A Target. Um, he'll really be, you know, looking at where and how folks are targeting um, nonprofit organizations and what like very skilled, like quick things that you can do to build some skills and also, you know, create, enhance and, enhance and protect your organization's work online. Um, so join us for that too. Um, on Thursday, April 29th, we will be doing the second round of um, audience outlook monitor updates um, for this year. This is a research study with Wolf Brown. Basically they are serving um, audiences at arts organizations to better understand um, where and how they are comfortable with returning to art spaces. And so basically this will be a re research report out um, on the 29th about uh, the April data and where and how people are feeling about returning to museums and performing art centers and all of that. So feel free to check that out and also you know register for that program. It's always really great information about um, the art space and, and also just the greater you know world and comfortability as it pertains to returning back to art spaces. Um, on Wednesday, May 5th, we'll be doing our next Digital Access to the Arts program. This will be with Eight Bridges Workshop, Sarah Lutman, who's the principal there. She will be um, you know, presenting a smorgasbord, for lack of a better word, on all of the arts and technology research she and her team have been doing um, over the past year. Um, there's lots of really fascinating stuff that um, she'll be pre presenting on as it pertains to arts and technology and where it's going and where, um, where and how, you know, your organization can be thinking about the future of arts and technology and where technology intersects in your work um, and, you know, where artists and how to support artists who are working at the intersection of arts and technology are too. So feel free to join us for that. And then immediately following that program, we'll do a hack session on NFTs, which our crazy new um, fangled technology. I don't really even know really like what to call them, but they are changing the art market. And I just read a really amazing Atlantic article about them um, the other day. And we're really excited to be doing a program on this kind of emergent trend as it pertains to arts and technology too. Um, of note, some funding opportunities. Um, we are the regional regranter for the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Um, we, and by regional regranter, I mean we are the regranter for Wayne County specifically. Um, if you're in Washtenaw County, it's the Arts Alliance. If you're in Macomb County, it is um, the uh, Anton Center for the Arts. Um, but we will be regranting arts equipment and supplies grants and also bus grants. So if you know anybody who works in the K-12 space, do check those out. My colleague Penny Maria is dropping them in the chat. The applications are due next Friday, April 16th. Um, and then also a more nationally um, based funding opportunity um, via Bloomberg Philanthropies is the Asphalt Art Initiative. Um, this is helping cities use art and community engagement to improve street safety and revitalize public space as a proud pedestrian and bike rider. Um, this is just a really great opportunity to, you know, make our streets safer and also, um, you know, give funding to cities specifically to do arts um, programming and art, you know, public art projects. Um, so if you know anybody who works at the city level, um, for anybody in our region, this is also a national focus. So maybe you have a cousin in Puerto Rico who works for a city government for the city municipality of San Juan, like send it that, their way. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, our graphic recorder today is Yana Zaro. Um, she will be um, graphic recording a conversation and presentations. We're always glad to have her here. Yana's an artist um, and graphic recorder and activist um, who is beaming in from Ypsilanti. We are so grateful to have her part take in this whole program series. Um, a huge shout out and thank you to all of our wonderful partners who um, support us in supporting the arts and cultural sector here in Southeast Michigan. There are many and we are very thankful for their support and also their partnership and co-thinking on program design and funding opportunities and everything that helps us support um, the arts and cultural sector here. Um, and without further ado, um, we are here for protecting online content legally and secure. We'll be hearing from the legal perspective from Carolyn Giordano and Anita Marinelli from the law firm of Miller Canfield, um, who will talk specifically about intellectual property and copyright and you know how to protect content legally online. And then John Oberhide from Duo Security and um, Cisco, who will really be zooming in on um, cybersecurity for nonprofits. So really excited to be pairing these two 
and three really, because um, there's three people, but two concepts um, and, and content experts um, in this program today. And we're glad you're joining us too. Um, also, this program will be recorded and we'll be sharing it out um, following the program too. So without further ado, I'm gonna welcome Carolyn and Anita um, to the virtual stage to um, present and join us. Carolyn and Anita, thanks for being here from Windsor and um, Ann Arbor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam, and it's it's great to be here. Um, as Adam said, today we're going to be talking about protecting your online content legally, at least uh, Anita and I are, um, and we're going to be speaking specifically about two kinds of intellectual property that are important for artists and content creators to understand. Um, that's copyright and trademark, and we're also going to discuss some particular issues that crop up when we're dealing with your IP that is posted online. So starting out with copyright, just broadly, what is copyright? So the framers of our constitution understood that works of original authorship had value that should be protected. And they gave authors and inventors the exclusive right to their works for limited times. And the reason to do this legally, um, to give the exclusive right to authors and content creators is not only to recognize that these things have value, but also to encourage artists and scientists to continue to create the original work. So copyright exists for original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And so what does that mean? That just means that copyright needs to be minimally, very minimally original, and it needs to be fixed, which means sufficiently permanent uh, enough to be copied, written down, reproduced, etc. So once, once you create an original work that is fixed, you automatically have a copyright in the work. So if I sit here and and draw a picture of a bowl of fruit on a napkin um, and it's fixed, uh, I have a copyright in that by law. That's, that's all, all you need for it. So copyrightable subject matter, um, I have a list of copyrightable subject matter up right here. As you can see, copyright protects all manner of artistic works. It's really the province, the IP province of the arts. Um, interestingly, it also protects computer programs and categorizes computer programs as literary works, which I always think is funny. Um, so copyright rights. Copyright gives the artist or the owner of the copyright, but today we're talking about artists, uh, a number of different exclusive rights. It, uh, number one, the right to reproduction of the artistic work. That means only you can reproduce the copies. Uh, the right to modification and adaptation of the artwork, also the uh, ability to prepare derivative works of the original artwork. For instance, if you have a story you, uh, that you've written, you also have the exclusive right to, uh, to produce the sequel to the story. Uh, copyright gives you the right, of course, to distribute your art, artwork by, right, by license, sale, or rental. Um, the, it gives you the opportunity and the right to perform your artwork publicly and to display it publicly. However, copyright, even though copyright gives you a lot of exclusive rights, there are also limits on copyright protection. It only, copyright only protects expression. It doesn't protect underlying ideas. So it also, so it excludes underlying ideas, procedures, processes, methods, systems, etc. And so for instance, you can't copyright a color, you can't copyright a list of instructions, uh, you can't copyright a recipe, um, and you can't copyright an invention. Um, and, the, and the reason you can't do this is because uh, you want to, uh, we don't want to allow copyright law to mon monopolize ideas and stifle competition and creative progress. So I said uh, earlier that I have a copyright as soon as I, I draw my little picture on a napkin, but if, if I automatically have a copyright as soon as that happens, um, why would I ever register a copyright? And you probably have heard about copyright registration. Well, there are a lot of benefits to copyright registration. Um, first of all, it's relatively inexpensive. It's about 45 to $65. Um, you can file a, a registration application online with the Copyright Office, which is www.copyright.gov, um, which is a very, very helpful, extremely helpful website and pretty user friendly. Um, but most importantly, you need to have your copyright registered to be able to bring an action uh, that is a lawsuit for copyright infringement. So registration is really the key to the, your, your ability to actually enforce a copyright. Um, registration gives you, gives you the ability to enforce it and ultimately to receive uh, money damages if you prevail in your copyright infringement lawsuit. 
um, more generally registration signals to the public that you care enough about your your art and your intellectual property to to take that extra step to protect it. So copyright infringement. Basically, copyright infringement is the legal violation of uh, the copyright law. So if anyone infringes uh, on any of those exclusive rights that I mentioned earlier, you can bring a lawsuit for copyright infringement provided that you've registered your copyright. And I have the remedies listed here. I won't go into them, but probably the most salient is the money damages. That's $750 to $30,000 per uh, infringed work um, as, as considered by the court. So now more than ever, when we're talking about online, you know, a lot of copyright infringement is occurring online. Um, when we're dealing with artistic works online, it's incredibly important to ask yourself if you have permission for the artworks that you're posting. Uh, permission, you'll often hear it called licensing um, in the IP context, but licensing and permission are essentially the same thing. Um, and one, one reason it's important to get permission for posting online works is that publishing companies or copyright rights organizations hire people to scour the internet for unauthorized use of copyrighted works. So these organizations um, will hit the user up uh, with the threat of copyright infringement lawsuit in order to get the user, the poster of the copyrighted work to settle a lawsuit for, before it happens. That is to, to, pay, to pay the copyright owner money. If you don't pay the money, um, these organizations will continue to bother and hound you and make life difficult for you. And ultimately they may file a lawsuit against you. And um, it, you know, in many cases, the copyright infringer, the person or organization posting copyrighted work has absolutely no idea that they're doing anything wrong um, or, you know, or that, that they're doing anything wrong. So our, our law firm, interestingly enough, actually got to know the folks at Culture Source a few years ago through a small copyright issue that they ran into on this topic. So this story, is, it's a good reminder of how many copyright issues can emerge online simply when you think you're you're doing something totally above board that everybody else does. So the story is that a, a few years ago, a Culture Source member museum was running a film and Culture Source promoted the film on their website. The museum had a full copyright rights to run the film and gave Culture Source, I believe, a press release. And then um, a Culture Source posted the press release on their website, along with what I believe was a still photo from the film. Um, and the photo was just a photo of a guy talking. It wasn't even really an interesting photo, um, but they just posted this up online with the press release. Um, so this is again, something that companies do all the time um, and, and no idea that anything is being untoward or anything at all. Um, so after Culture Source posted this, this uh, press release with a the photograph, they received uh, a letter from an attorney from a cop copyright watchdog organization stating it represented the rights of the copyright holder in the image. And um, we believe you've infringed our copyright and please can you pay us a licensing fee of X amount of dollars and not, not insubstantial amount, right? So um, our firm came in to look at this and we did some due diligence and, and this was in fact a representative of the copyright owner in the photograph of the rights holder. And we helped negotiate a favorable resolution to that um, small dispute. But in part, we were able to do that because of copy, uh, Culture Source's uh, nonprofit mission and what it was. But the long, long and the short of it is that that's not a good situation. It's not a situation you wanna find yourself in. Because the truth is, even if you have good intentions and you don't realize that you're posting somebody else's copyrighted content, that doesn't necessarily really matter. And, and you can be on the hook for, um, for copyright infringement if, you, um, if you're not careful about what you post. So make sure you have permission for the copyrighted works you are posting online. Um, that being said, are there any exceptions to permission? So yes, there are. Um, the biggest exception by far is fair use. You may have heard of this. If there are some artists in the audience there. Um, so by far the most crucial issue when we're considering what, whether there's a potential risk of copyright infringement is whether the use in question is, uh, the allegedly infringing use can be characterized as fair use. So fair use is a statutory exception to copyright protection. And when courts are considering whether a use is fair, they have a four factor balancing test. None of these factors alone is um, dispositive. The court sort of looks at all of them. 
and, and makes, uh, makes a judgment. But the first factor is probably, not probably, it is definitely the most important. So the first factor is the purpose and character of the work used, including whether such use is of a commercial nature or is for nonprofit purposes. So as I said, this is the single most important uh, factor in recent cases. And what the court looks at here uh, is does the new use of the, of the copyrighted work create, create something transformative? Does it create something with new meaning, new expression, such that the original work is transformed? So a sort of classic example of this is parody. Um, parody is a very good example of fair use. So if you think about a Weird Al song, if you know Weird Al, that's parody, right? He's, he's taking original so famous songs that we all know and taking a lot of elements from them, but also transforming them into something that is funny and often comments on the original. Very likely to be seen as fair use because it's a parody. Um, the second or the sort of factor 1A is to what extent is the work commercial? Um, the less commercial a work, the more nonprofit a work, the more likely it is to be seen as fair use. Um, which I think is probably good for everybody in the audience here. That being said, that factor is not dispositive at all. Uh, number two is the nature of the work used. Creative works usually get more copyright protection than others. So it's you're you're less likely to have a fair use defense if you're copy if you're um, accused of in, of infringing a creative work. And historical, scientific, uh, nonfiction works receive a less, less copyright protection under this analysis. Um, unpublished works tend to get more copyright protection than published works under this analysis. Um, and and that just, that's just tends to be the way it's shaken out in the cases. Um, the third factor is the amount and substantiality of the portion of the copyrighted work used. So here the court looking at this would take into account both the quantity of what the infringer, accused infringer took from the original work and the quality. So the more you take, you know, the, the less likely it's going to be fair use. And um, did, you, did you take something that was a really important part of the original work, right? So if you in your uh, novel quote the most important part of a previous novel, right, or, the, you know, the the part that everybody knows, it's it's less likely to be seen as a fair use because you're taking the most important part. Um, and number four, the last factor in the fair use analysis is the effect of the infringing or potentially infringing use on the market for the original work. So the more transformative the use, the less likely there's a strong harmful market effect on the original work. One way to think about this factor is to look at the harm to the market for potential derivatives of the underlying work. So you can ask yourself, is that secondary work, potentially infringing work, uh, likely to substitute in the market for the original? There's a famous um, copyright case about this called, well, it's informally called the Harry Potter lexicon case. And in this case, um, J.K. Rowling, obviously the hugely famous author of the hugely famous Harry Potter series um, sued the publisher of a reference book uh, that that an author made a reference book of Harry Potter stuff. I don't know exactly what was in the reference book, but it was not sanctioned by J.K. Rowling, but it had to do with all of the stuff in the books. And uh, J.K. Rowling sued, said this was copyright infringement. And the uh, author of the reference book said, no, 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 this is fair use. We're just taking elements of the Harry Potter books and we're rearranging them and we're creating something transformative and new. And the court said, no, you're not. <laughs> in a sense, essence, this is not fair use because your reference book is harming J the potential market for JK Rowling's um, ability to do her own reference book with her own copyrighted work. And in fact, I think she had several books that were sort of like reference books that she had not yet published that she wanted to. So the court said, if this cuts into the market for that, um, that's an indication that this isn't fair use. Um, so that's just a really quick, um, we could spend hours and hours and hours on fair use, but that's just a really quick summary. Um, and the important thing, thing to take away from this though is it's, it, you don't necessarily really wanna rely on the idea that you think your use is fair because it's a very unpredictable analysis and you can't just assume that what you're doing is fair use. E and even if you're right, you might have to go to court to prove it. So. Um, so that's, that's my cautionary, cautionary tale on that. 
Um, another exception to copyright permission that you may have heard of is public domain. So public domain works are works that for one reason or another are not governed by copyright and are free for everyone to use. Generally, these are works out of copyright created before 1926 in the United States. Um, you know, I've listed some examples up there, obviously all of Shakespeare, Moby Dick, Little Women, you know, Beethoven, all of these um, works that are old enough that you can use them freely without threat of copyright infringement. Um, and then I think we have just a couple visuals of works that are in the public domain. And then um, back to getting permission, I mentioned I think the most important thing that everyone should, should think about in this audience is making sure they have permission for the works that they post. So here are just some steps to think about if you have a copyrighted work that you wanna post online. Um, you know, you wanna identify the owner of, of the work. Sometimes that's really easy and it's just a, a person or entity. Often though, there are rights organizations that you need to contact the Creative Commons I've just listed, or sorry, uh, not Creative Commons, Copyright Clearance Center is one. Um, ASCAP, CSAC, and BMI, which are called the Performance Rights Organizations, um, are for musical works. You often will contact those. But if you do a little bit of Googling on this, you can usually find who you need to contact. They want to, they, they want to make it easy for you to contact them because they uh, want your licensing fees. So, so find the owner or licensing organization and then think about what, what uses or what rights you want to license, right? Um, you may only need permission for some rights. For instance, you may want to perform a play, but you don't necessarily want distribution rights for the play. So just think about what, what parts of the copyright rights you need. Um, obviously get the cost for permission. Any rights organizations will, will give you the cost gladly and then make sure you get your permission or your license in writing. And uh, all that being said, if, you're, if you are posting your own original images or uh, online, I just wanted to give you a few tips for maybe making it a little, little um, harder for, for infringement to occur, even though infringement occurs a lot online. Um, for images especially, you can use low resolution images. Um, if they print poorly and there's less of a chance of copying. You can add a watermark. Um, obviously a watermark shows that, that it's someone else's work. The same with the copyright notice. You can put that little C um, with your name if it's your own work without being registered. You don't need to register to do that. And, and that's kind of puts people on notice that that's a copyrighted work. Um, you can make your contact information clear near the work so you're easy to contact for someone to seek your own permission to use it. Um, dub, uh, disable the right click function. Apparently the right click function makes it easier for others to save your images to their devices. So if you disable right click, that can help a little bit with the uh, infringement potential. And finally, if you see someone uh, who you think is infringing your copyrighted work online, call them up or, or maybe email them or contact them and you know politely suggest to them that this is your work and can they, can they cease and desist from posting it. And, and a lot of times people don't even know that they're doing this and, and will take it down. Um, and, you know, if, if they refuse to take it down, that's another issue. And maybe, you know, at that point you think about going further, but um, always best to be polite and see where you can get with that. So with that, I will, I will um, hand the baton over to Anita and I think she's going to talk a little bit more about copyright and then trademark. Great. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, so dovetailing into what um, Carolyn was just talking about. Um, the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act is actually another tool in a copyright owner's tool belt that they can use to remove infringing content. Um, so basically the, the DMCA as it's known is a law that specifically addresses how copyright infringement are handled when they happen online. Um, so in the late nineties, this started to become more of a problem. And so Congress enacted the DMCA to try and deal with and it's essentially got two main prongs. So the first prong is to help um, internet service providers. So the big guys like Google, um, who owns YouTube, all of those sort of companies deal with infringement claims that get lobbied at them for things that are posted online. Um, YouTube doesn't wanna be liable if there is a copyrighted movie on their website. And so what the DMCA basically does is it creates provisions that help them avoid any liability, which are known as safe harbor provisions. So 
if these larger um, service providers do certain things, then they can't be held liable. Um, and, and so most of the requirements under the DMCA require them to have some sort of reporting portal where people can report infringement and that helps them avoid any liability. Um, now, when it comes to individuals, so if you've reached out politely as Carolyn suggested, the infringer digs their heels in, says, no, I'm not going to. The DMCA allows individual copyright owners to send, um, they're called DMCA takedown notices. And basically what that means is you can send out a notice and slowly strip away um, the infringing material from online. Um, it's not a complicated process, um, but it's certainly not simple and it is something most people go through a lawyer just because there is a lot of follow-up um, required. And I mean, a simple example of this, it just came across my feed this morning. Um, so a picture of Khloe Kardashian was posted yesterday. Um, it was an unedited photo of her. She clearly didn't like it. And her lawyers went to work stat, said, this is her photo. She took the photo and it's nearly been scrubbed from the internet. And so, I mean, that's more of a tabloid way that this can happen, but that is what you can do essentially just remove all of the copyrighted material um, through this process. And with enough gusto, they usually move pretty quick. Um, and something new that I'm just going to briefly touch on, um, the Congress last year enacted um, legislation that is going to create a copyright claims board, um, and especially for smaller organizations and artists, um, the threat of a federal lawsuit is very um, scary and daunting. Um, and for smaller artists who own copyrights, it, it just might not be feasible to go through the entire litigation process. So essentially with the copyright claims board, it's almost like a small claims court for individual copyright holders. It's got a quicker resolution time. They're, um, I think the, the goal time for, for the resolution of a claim is 120 days. The damages are limited and it's a much simpler process. Um, and so the goal with this is to help individual copyright owners um, for about lack of a better word, sue infringers without having to follow the formalities of federal court, which is very, very daunting and very, very expensive. Um, now, this doesn't come into effect until I believe it's later this year, yeah, December 27th of this year. So it's unclear how this is going to affect the copyright infringement landscape um, and whether those those companies that Carolyn was talking about who send you nasty grams asking you to pay will threaten this instead, it, it's unclear how it'll, how it'll shake out. But as an individual copyright owner, it's something that you could use um, to enforce your rights without having to go to court. Um, and just shifting gears slightly, so that's more of protecting, I guess, your, your creations and content and how to not misuse other people's. Um, something that ties in with this also is how you present yourself online and how you brand yourself online. Um, and that often relates to trademarks. And actually in Adam's intro earlier, you'll notice he put up a whole um, myriad of images and logos of the companies who support Culture Source. And, and those are called their trademarks. That is how they present themselves to the, to the world, basically, in a commercial context. And so um, it's how people distinguish themselves. And so you'll see in the top row, I have some of the more uh, bigger companies, the bigger companies. And on the bottom, you'll see, I actually pulled this from Culture Social's website as well. These are their supporters, these are their members. Um, and so you don't have to be a, a massive organization like Coca-Cola or Google to have a trademark. You can be a small organization, comes up with a logo or a name, and that's how you identify yourself. Um, and so the purpose is, is basically that, it's to identify yourself and distinguish your goods or services from someone else in the marketplace. And it helps consumers identify, oh, I know that's Coke. Oh, I know this is Google. Oh, um, and, and it helps with that recognition factor. Um, and so as you're thinking about how you're going to present your businesses online, as we move into more of a um, digital sphere lately, um, you want to think about selecting a trademark that um, is strong. So there's a gradient of trademarks. Um, and essentially, you want something that is as fanciful or arbitrary as possible. So um, something like Kodak. Kodak doesn't mean, doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't put in your mind um, really anything in particular. Probably now it does for photography, but at the time it didn't. Um, same thing with, with Apple. Apple 
yes, when you think of an apple, you think of the fruit and apple, but you don't think of a computer. And so those are those are good trademarks for those particular brands. Um, when you look at the generic side of things and generic trademarks and descriptive trademarks actually aren't registrable. So you want to stay away from those. Those are things that just describe what you're doing. So the Weather Channel, that's an obvious one. And you know, if you had Dave's Carpet Cleaning Company, that's another one. So you want to try and avoid those and um, pick something a, a little bit more um, fanciful or arbitrary if you're really trying to uh, differentiate yourself online. Um, and then there's proper trademark usage. And this applies to when you use your own trademarks, as well as if you're using um, someone else's. So on, on Culture Source's website, for instance, they put the logos up of the, of the companies that support them. And that's, that's the proper way to use their trademarks. They're the logos that they put out. We're also going to use the same. Um, if you were just using words, you always want to make sure that your trademark stands out from the text that surrounds it. Um, use capital letters, bold, colors. Um, you want to make sure that it stands out that, hey, this is a trademark. This isn't just a regular word. Um, another thing you want to make sure you do is never use a trademark as a verb. Um, Googling is a very, very common one. Um, and I wonder how much further we'll have to go before that, um, that causes a real problem for them. But, but it's a Google search. Um, it, it's not Googling. So that's, that's a big one. Um, and um, you always want to make sure that you use the proper trademark form and spelling. Um, you want to be consistent how you're using your trademark. You don't want to have five different spellings. You don't want to have five different versions. You want to make sure that you're consistent in what you're using. Um, the other thing you can do to make sure you're using a trademark properly is you can register it with the US Trademark Office. And when you register a trademark, you get to use that little R symbol. So as where Carolyn was talking about copyrights, you can put that little C symbol. As soon as you create a picture, you don't need to register it. Trademarks is a little bit different. Trademarks, you can only put the R symbol when you have a registration. So if you choose not to register, which is totally fine, you can use different marks. Um, so a superscript TM or SM, um, TM for trademark, SM if you're offering services for service mark, um, those are for marks that aren't registered. So as soon as you come up with something, you can put a superscript TM and that means it's your trademark, but it's not registered. Um, you don't want to use the circle R unless you have a registration um, because there are penalties if someone wants to call you out on that. Um, and this just goes back to what I was talking about with respect to proper trademark usage and my Googling example. Um, it, if improper trademark usage over time can actually defeat your trademark. Um, and so Xerox is, is a really powerful example. I mean, it became synonymous with photocopying. Um, so yeah, just go Xerox that. Um, there's another example as well. I don't know how many of you saw, it was about two or three years ago, um, the makers of Velcro put out a video in which they went through all of the trademarks that have been pretty much just died over time because they just become so common. So Velcro is the brand, hook and loop is what Velcro actually is, which I have never heard anybody say that before. Um, rollerblading, that's another one. Rollerblading is, is the brand. It's just become synonymous with inline skating. Google is moving in that direction and there's always this pushback and you'll see every, every year lawyers will get together and is Google dead yet? Um, and you often see those blog, those blog posts come out. Um, so yeah, that's one that they're trying very hard to defeat that. Um, and so that's why it's so important because if your trademark is misused enough, you can essentially lose it. Um, so, so that's why it's important. Um, and I talked about how you don't have to register a trademark, similar to copyright, you don't have to. Um, the benefits are it puts everybody on notice that you do have a trademark. And you can also um, attain the benefits of <laughs> federal registration in terms of suing um, on your federal registered mark. You can also sue on an unregistered trademark, um, but you can't using the federal rules. You're stuck in kind of common law and it, it gets a little bit messier. Um, it also adds a layer of protection when you get registered in that your registration becomes um, 
incontestable after a certain period of time and certain period of use. And so no one can really challenge your mark after that, um, barring, you know, if you messed up when you first did the registration or you were fraudulent or, or made some mistakes that way, but it, it adds a layer of protection. Um, and you get to use that fancy R symbol, as I said. Um, and, and just to touch on what happens for you if you find someone using your mark that you've selected and you have registered, or if you find yourself on the other side of a, of a nasty gram where you've used someone else's mark improperly, um, the, there is federal trademark infringement law and, and the penalties are, are similar to, to copyright law. Um, and so infringement occurs where a person uses a mark in common, in commerce, excuse me, um, and it is counterfeit or it is related to um, the offer of sale, distribution, advertising of goods or services that aren't basically uh, attached to the registrant. Um, and, and the test here is it doesn't have to be identical. It's, in, it's a long eight factor test and it's just whether it's likely to cause confusion. Um, and so that is, a, that is a core test and it takes a long time and a lot of money to litigate, which is why you wanna avoid trademark infringement as much as possible. And why if someone is using your mark, that's what you wanna look at. Is someone going to confuse whatever mark that person is using with the mark that I have registered? Um, and, and yeah, <laughs> it's not the, the funnest thing to, to explain. Um, in a court of law and it, it does cost money. So we wanna try and avoid it as much as possible, which is why proper trademark usage is so important. And with that, I think we're gonna to go to questions after. So I think I will turn it over to Adam again. Great. Yeah, thank you both so much. I have, I'm like, I've learned a lot already and I have lots <laughs> of questions that I'll save to the end. And, and also, you know, when you, when you mentioned Anita at one point, like the beginning presentation, I was like, oh my gosh, like, what did I do wrong? Like, am I going to get canceled? Like, <laughs> did I, did I not do it properly? So you did no, nothing I, wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's helpful in thinking through, you know, where, where I use logos and where I use, you know, photos and all that um, too, and, and protecting it. And hopefully, you know, folks tuning in will also find it relevant as they could reflect on their own work too. Um, thank you both so much. I'm going to pass it over to John. Again, if you guys have questions um, for the folks tuning in, um, please feel free to um, drop them in the chat or also raise your hand and we'll try um, to um, to have you ask your questions out loud um, near the end of the program. So once, once John um, is done presenting here, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. And uh, thanks, thanks for having me here. Um, I will uh, try not to bore you with too many slides here. Um, but I uh, have just a taste, just a little moose bouche of PowerPoint that'll hopefully uh, set us up for a, a good interactive discussion. So, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of shifting the conversation to talk a little bit about cybersecurity at nonprofits. Um, I would start by saying cybersecurity is impossibly unapproachable, right? And you're sitting there and you're like, how do I, how do I manage this? And you might hear in the headlines that you know, the Russian GRU has compromised the, you know, software supply chain of the U.S. government uh, through a vendor called SolarWinds. And you're sitting there like, yeah, that sounds terrifying. Like, <laughs> how do I, how do I stand the chance? So um, hopefully we can, we can simplify a little bit in this conversation of what you can do um, to at least raise the bar a little bit um, for your organization, your nonprofit, uh, to have a good cybersecurity posture. So, um, a lot of cybersecurity is like this, this gate here. You know, it's, it's good intention. Uh, you know, there was a, a, some thought process behind it, um, but largely ineffective. And this is what we call security theater. You know, things that might sound like a good idea, but don't actually mitigate risk for your organization. And in the real world, uh, probably the most infamous example is, you know, TSA airport security. You go through a lot of steps, you know, you get pat downs, you get searched, you know, there's lots of uh, things that might make you feel safe, but in reality, it might not be um, actually reducing, um, reducing risk for, uh, for yourself or for TSA. In the cyber world, this might be things like, like antivirus. Like it's not a bad thing, but it doesn't make you invincible on the internet and you still need kind of safe computing practices. On the other hand, 
uh, particularly us security practitioners, like we like to maybe, you know, go to one extreme or the other uh, too often. There's a lot of security controls out there that might be too effective. Uh, like no one's getting in this gate, you know, that's for sure. Like this is a really good lock. You're never, <laughs> never getting that gate open. Uh, in other words, a lot of security is not actually usable by humans. And that, that balance of security and usability is, is, is truly critical. So maybe at a, you know, at a, a past corporate job, if you had to share a file with a, a colleague, you had to fire up your corporate laptop, you had to log into the VPN, you had to jump through a bunch of hoops uh, just to use the on-premise, you know, file server to share that, that file. And that's a, that's a problem because if you make it really painful and complicated to do a basic task in the, the name of security, then, you know, I, as an employee, I'm just going to use Dropbox to share the file, or I'm going to airdrop you know, the file to my, my colleague for my iPhone. So this, this balance of, of um, kind of risk management is really important. It's like, how do we do things that make us safe, but that are also aligned with, you know, the usability expectations of our, our people and the needs um, of our, our organization. So cybersecurity is all about this balance. It's, it's all about operating in a, in a gray area because there are, there's no silver bullets. You know, there's no such thing as being 100% secure. And actually being secure might mean something entirely different to different people or different organizations. So that might, uh, that might seem complicated, but it turns out cybersecurity is actually not that complicated. It's just another form of risk management, which, you know, whether you realize it or not, you're practicing on a daily basis, you know, in your life or in your, your business. So this here is, is kind of the foundation of risk management. You have assets, they might have weaknesses, and there's threats out there that want to take advantage of those weaknesses. And that creates risk. So um, ignore the fact that this looks like a, a math equation. You're not actually trying to calculate anything, but just use this as a, a frame of reference. So security is all about what you do with that, that risk. You can mitigate and try to reduce that risk. Or in a lot of cases, you can actually accept that risk and move on as, a, as an organization. And you, know, you might use a similar framework to think about uh, copyright, like we talked about today, like what are your assets and how are you protecting them with um, the tools available to you uh, provided by, you know, copyright or, or trademark law. So um, I don't know if I could pull up the chat here. I wanted to throw it out to you guys in the audience, um, since you're the experts in your own domain. Like what are, what are some of the things that are, are worth protecting in your nonprofit organization you know, throw any quick ideas you have in the chat here and I'll see if I can, uh, I can pull that up. There's no, no bad answers, no wrong answers here. Just fire away. What are things that are important that you would want to protect for your organization? I'll let people noodle on it for a second. There we go. We got login credentials. That's really good. We got tax identification or tax information, employee identification numbers. Those two are very interrelated because if you steal the login credentials, maybe you could get access to the employee identification numbers or other PII, as you might hear it. Any other thoughts? Like what's the, what's the heart and soul of uh, a nonprofit? We got our database, our email accounts, our web server, a lot of infrastructure. Donation account, tax information, HR ID. That's really critical if you're a nonprofit and you you fund your your operations um, through donations. If uh, if something happens there and you you know you you lose your your financial wherewithal to operate, then you know your your mission's at risk. So those are those are uh, we got one more website content. Um, yes, and your public facing materials um, ties very closely into reputation as well. So those are some, some areas that um, are really important for nonprofits. Your donors, their sense of information, your finances, you wanna protect your, your money that you, you have to operate the organization, your reputation, um, even just your operational capabilities. You know, your nonprofit exists for some mission and you wanna avoid disruption of your operations. So, you know, some of the, the threats there, um, which were some of which were, were highlighted uh, if I can steal your login credentials, if I can fish your users, if I can trick you into giving up your password, I might be able to perform what's known as account takeover. 
I can access your email. I can access your collaboration tools, potentially access your, your financial accounts and other systems. And all the information that's stored in there is, is now at risk. There's also um, some widespread threats of social engineering. There's a, 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 a technique called business email compromise, um, where if I trick you into initiating a wire transfer um, to my you know, overseas bank account, I can really easily commit wire fraud and steal money. And there's things like malware and ransomware that can actually have a pretty you know, substantial impact on your, your operations as an organization. If I lock up all your, your, you know, your computers and your data and your infrastructure, it can take you, you know, weeks, months to, to clean up. And in that time, again, you're not focused on your mission. You're focused on trying to respond to this, this cyber attack. So um, those are some of the challenges that um, I think are not specific to nonprofits, but um, particularly for, for small organizations that don't have a lot of um, budget, a lot of expertise, a lot of resources. They might be at or below like the security poverty line, like you can barely afford to you know, protect yourself. Um, with the, the limited resources you have. Um, those are real challenges that, um, that we need to deal with. And here's a couple just uh, you know, examples of, of those threats. The first one is uh, business email compromise. An attacker would spoof an email from, you know, say your, your executive director or your CEO and send it to your CFO or send it to finance lead or, or treasurer saying, yeah, I'm urgent need to you know, wire $80,000 to this bank account. You receive this and you say, oh, of course, I'm going to go do that. Uh, my executive director just told me to. And you wake up, you know, this happens Friday, you know, an hour before the Fedwire window closes. The attackers are no dummies. And you, you notice this Monday when you come back in and the money's already gone and is, you know, unretrievable. That happens far too frequently. And it's a really cheap and easy attack for attackers to basically spam out to every organization on the internet. This other one, this was a headline from yesterday. So fresh off the presses, um, a cyber criminal uh, ransomware gang has, you know, kind of deployed their ransomware across a, a Florida school district and is demanding $40 million to unlock their data and their machines and their infrastructure. So that's a big bill. And, you know, they must not understand the U.S. public school system if they think that we've got $40 million uh, to spare to pay this ransom. Um, but you know what else are you going to do in that case? You you have to rebuild all of your infrastructure, which is incredibly you know expensive and, and challenging as well. So um, you're like, this is this is neat, neat John, but just tell me what to do. <laughs> so the good news is that you know securing yourself online is not actually that complicated. You can take some some very small accessible steps that make a really big difference in your your online security posture, and it. It really boils down to how you secure your account logins. So you can do things like enable multi-factor authentication for your email, for your collaboration services, for your financial accounts. It's much more widely available in the, the modern day. And um, that's pretty accessible. You should be able to do that across your team. If you can take it a, a step up, you can actually leverage a password manager um, to augment that, to help deal with the sprawl of of passwords, especially for um, things where you might have a shared account, like maybe you have a shared Twitter account, maybe you have a shared bank account, and securely sharing um, those credentials is, is really important. Another part is around the devices and applications you use, you know, really modernizing your, your fleet of devices and the services that you choose to operate your, your nonprofit. Um, it seems uh, it seems small, but having a relatively, you know, if you're if you Got those Windows 7 laptops, you know, get some new ones to go to Windows 10. If you've got, you know, really out of date mobile devices, either Android or iPhone devices, you know, kind of refreshing those devices and making sure they're up to date is uh, some of the most important things you can do to, um, you know, secure your, your organization. And generally, you know, leverage the cloud. If you can minimize the amount of infrastructure you have, you can leverage things like G Suite and Office 365 and Box, you're not only getting probably better productivity, better collaboration on your team, but with less things to manage, there's less cost for you and actually less risk. Because you can bet that Google and Microsoft and Box and all these providers are investing a lot in security, which means you don't have to invest as much in security. And um, if you do these things, you're, you're eliminating a, a huge chunk of risk of being online. 
Um, and of course, if you have more questions, we can we can dive into that in the Q and A. But I did want to leave you with this uh, this quote from Mark from his upcoming session of "Not for profit does not mean not a target. You might not be a top target of you know foreign state sponsored intel groups, um, but you do have assets that are valuable to a, a broad swath of uh, cyber criminals out there. So again, the good news is that cybersecurity is not as complex as it as it might seem, and hopefully you have some some new ways to think about it. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. This is um, really great. Um, and yeah, I, I laughed a few times. I mean, the like the 40 million thing is crazy. That is such a lot. I mean, these cyber criminals, and I think that's kind of across the board in both of your presentations. It's just like, it really is like a shot in the dark when it comes to both, you know, the legal, like Khloe Kardashian, you know, the 40 million requests from cybersecurity. It just is very random. And I think, you know, being able to be prepared um, regardless, both legally and cyber secure wise, is like essential for organizations. I mean, you know, as um, Carolyn noted, our our own copyright um, case, you know, connected us to the lo the lawyers of Miller Canfield. Um, but then also, you know, in thinking about cybersecurity, I often sometimes get emails from our executive director Omari that say, "Hey, can you do this task for me?" And it's in my spam, and he would never. I mean, he doesn't ask me like he doesn't use the word task. <laughs> He's like, you know, usually calls me. So um, that's something we've been thinking about too, is like, okay, how do we actually, you know, make our, our work more cyber secure as well? Um, so yeah, I appreciate all the, all the um, you know, insights that you both shared. Um, and I also encourage um, folks tuning in with the, um, their questions to raise their hand, um, which is uh, at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, chat or Zoom, you know, platform. And so feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you and um, we can have, you, you know, have you join the conversation and, you know, make any questions or comments. Um, so I'm going to preface with that first. So um, Ava, Ava, I'm going to allow you to talk and um, you will be able to ask your question. Hi, everybody. It's Ava. Hi, Adam. Hey, Ava. Good to hear you. Yeah, and thank you for this incredibly helpful and efficient program. Um, well, yeah, that $4 million sounds like a parody almost, like making fun out of the system. <laughs> so yeah, um, a lot of beautiful things came to mind. A couple of things I just want to quickly um, talk about. One is that, so a few years ago, a photographer very randomly in downtown took my image and then uh, about a couple of months after, I see a colleague and then they say, wow, we see this massive portrait of you as a part of this mosaic, um, you know, portrait wall inside the uh, Quicken Loans on the wall. And I was furious because all of my work professionally and personally is focused on like healing the land and it, it was just, uh, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I never signed anything with the photographer, obviously. And um, I was not informed that my portrait was on the wall. And I had no idea how long it was on that wall representing the exact company that my work is kind of against of and uh, endangering my reputation. I'm still furious of it. I emailed the photographer back then. They apologized and brought the photo down, but still it didn't uh, manage the harm that uh, impacted me as a local organizer. Um, so yeah, that was just like something I wanted to share and get some clarity in terms of what I could have done or like, um, you know, how I maybe could ask more information now after a couple of years, that's that. Another thing was, so since 2010, I've been doing online uh, curatorial programs, events, workshops, uh, festivals, you name it, connecting distance uh, locations. In 2017, we launched our uh, telepresence festival remote. And um, since then, we have been actively doing online programming. That year, I had some conversations with some lawyers for getting a trademark. But at the same time, because our work was kind of anti-commerce, anti-capitalism, uh, we decided to not trademark. Long story short, when the pandemic hit, uh, we see all over the media this new music festival that they claimed they're the first in the world. 
And it was just, again, disappointing to know that we have been doing this work for the past 10 years, and now suddenly everybody's claiming to be the first, and who cares who's the first? But that was like uh, the other moment that we're like, oh, as we do our radical decapitalizing, decolonizing work, how could we be more strategic in relation to navigating the actual loops and um, you know moments that are needed to protect our intellectual uh, labor and our community? And at the moment, we are expanding more also as an online uh, anti-oppression uh, independent uh, TV embracing more our like independent media uh, identity and we are getting more uh, you know notif notices from uh, the, the international national local organizations museums they are uh, screening and showing our work we get more like circulations online so we are in this phase of trying to uh, come up with a uh, practical process for distributing the uh, payments and making sure that all the artists always get credited. So I just thought that I would really appreciate if there would be maybe a, a you know, um, a possibility for an appointment with the lawyers for talking further about this and uh, just figuring out a process that could make sure that uh, when we do uh, presentations of the work, let's say uh, an example is that in the current museum at the MOCAT, they showed one of our videos. There's a very small stipend of like $500 that comes to the nonprofit. And from that money, I wanna make sure that each and every contributing artist get a cut and then the institution gets a cut. And we are now writing the contracts for what would that look like in terms of copyright and also uh, distributing the uh, resources and income. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Ava. And for everybody, um, Ava is working with Poetic Societies and um, they're a really great organization. So yeah, thanks for being here, Ava. Um, and, you know, I, I'm hearing, I think in, in your question, you know, the, the topic of mutuality, which was something that I was, I was curious about when Carolyn and, and Anita were presenting too. You know, we think about not only protecting our own organization, but then also, or like the artists that we're working with, but then also vice versa too. You know, it's like when we're collaboratively, you know, sharing an image, how are we, you know, presenting what's like, oh, like this is how I protect the image and you will ensure that you'll protect the image this way too. So I think, you know, that I think your first question kind of really speaks to that. And I'm wondering if um, Anita or Carolyn have any, you know, best practices or insights as it pertains to that or anything else you that you were thinking about when Ava was, was speaking too. Anita, should I, should I go first? <laughs> um, on, the, on the photograph, uh, uh, that was put up at the Quick and Loans building of you. I, I, I'm afraid that I, I don't know how much you could have done other than what you did do, which I think was the right thing to do. Um, so if, 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 the, if the photographer took a photo of you, um, you don't necessarily have a copyright in that photo, right? Because they took it, they have a copyright in it. Should they be posting it without your permission? No, but that's not necessarily a copyright infringement issue. It's more of um, a, a right to your likeness or a right of publicity issue, um, which is a slightly different um, area of law. But I think, I, I'm not sure what you could have done, honestly, other than ask them to take it down. You know, I think that's the right response. Um, if, if they had kept it up and if you could prove that you were losing money in some way or you were losing a business reputation in some way, I mean, I suppose you could have a potential legal action, but you know those things are expensive. So I, I think um, the the best thing to do is to just request that that this be taken down and and hope that hope for the best um, because it, you you wouldn't necessarily have a copyright in an image that somebody else took of you. you I mean, you, you, it's not you wouldn't necessarily you would not have it because you didn't create that image, even though it's of your face. Um, so I what what were the second questions? I think the second question was kind of just about how to best prepare um, your organizations, um, you know, or like the when you're working with like an artist, for example, or like in the photo case, like, you know, if the press release, for example, like when they right. send that our way and, you know, there's there's some sort of having to deal with like a shared understanding of, of the copyright as it pertains to the work involved. And so I'm wondering, you know, are there best practices, um, you know, other than just like sharing like the 
the as you detailed in the presentation like the different like sort of um ways that you can mention the copyright but to really ensure like hey i'm sharing this press release these are you know is it just being like overly detailed or you know how do you see folks best kind of like approaching the mutuality of like sharing content between two different parties yeah i mean i i think it's um I think it's just unfortunately being really vigilant and checking every time that that um, whoever's content you're posting hat is is authorized right and has the, the appropriate licensing and I think in just to use that I, I don't want to come back to cultures, you know, because this was just a very small issue um, that was corrected but you know I mean just uh, you know the the film itself was licensed, but um, the underlying photograph wasn't so every, every time you're posting something that's not your original stuff just make sure you have you have permission to use it and in that case it would have been going back and making sure you had the permission to use the still image online or whatever um and it, and it goes for artists that you're working in, in conjunction with too because if if you're using other people's work in your own um installation you know it, you can you can be caught up in a copyright claim as well anita do you have no classes? i i was going to touch on her I think she had a third question about okay. um, they mentioned that they were the first and then other people were claiming they were the first. Um, so trademark law doesn't necessarily protect you as being the first to do something. It protects if you are the first person to use that name with your goods. Um, so if you start, you know, a clothing line and you call it bananas, and it gets very famous, You, someone else can't open up a clothing line necessarily and call it bananas. Um, that's kind of the, the Apple example. Um, and so the proof of activity of doing it first, them saying that they were doing it first when you were doing it first, that's more of a false advertising issue, uh, which is another area of law. And, and I mean, yes, you can bring false advertising lawsuits, but you would need to show that you were somehow harmed by their false advertisement. Um, so they shouldn't be doing that either. Um, but if you truly were the first, then you could say that um, and not put yourselves at risk of a false advertising claim. But it is it is a dis different sphere of law and a trademark really wouldn't have helped you um, um, in, that, in that instance. If they were using the same name as you, um, it for the same thing, that would be more of a trademark issue. Great, thank you both. Um, we have some more questions, but um, just to to um, diversify a little bit, I'm wondering, you know, what are three or three pet peeves for you know both John and the, from the cybersecurity front, and then Anita and Carolyn from the copyright and legal front. You know, what are three pet peeves that you see, um, you know, that you know you just see other out in the world, and you're like, oh, like. I wish they were doing this instead, or, um, you know, kind of a fun question. I, we're all experts in our own different ways about certain things. And so I'm wondering, you know, as it pertains to cybersecurity, John, like, are there pet peeves that you see people, like, things that folks are doing way too common um, that just irk you? And, you know, the same goes to um, you, Anita, and Carolyn in um, your work, too. Yeah, maybe, maybe one kind of general or big pet peeve I see in in the security space is blaming people. You know, we're all trying to do our job, you know, be productive people and employees. And oftentimes you'll see security advice um, that's oriented around like the human, you know, it's a human problem. Like your users are stupid and they should not do unsafe things. And oftentimes the advice is like, don't click on weird links or don't open attachments. Um, don't go to those websites. And it's like, that's what using computers is about. It's about clicking on links and opening attachments and you know being on the internet. Um, so in, in my mind, like we, we can't create technological systems where users have to like walk on a, a tightrope or be a cybersecurity expert in order to operate them safely. So technology needs to be kind of safe by, by default. And we need to stop blaming users for um, for cybersecurity lapses. And I think we're actually making some some progress there. You know, when you buy an iPhone, that's a more secure device that your five year old can use if they have an iPhone um, than you know was accessible to the NSA like a decade ago. 
and that's a that's a you know kind of massive transformation that we are starting to kind of thread the needle between security and usability and having devices that people love but that also respect our, our security and privacy Do you want me to get I because I, I know what mine is. Um, I um, the increase in troll litigation, um, I think, is something that bothers um, a lot of lawyers and troll litigation is something um, typically it's uh, an entity that's non practicing. Um, really, all they do is sue in order to get revenue. Um, and we are definitely seeing an uptake in that um, across all IP spheres, um, especially patents, it has really upticked, um, but it's getting more with the copyright areas. Well, not as much on the trademark side, um, but, but copyright troll litigation, just bothersome litigation is, is also upticking. And I think it's making it harder for creatives um, or smaller companies to, um, to succeed because, getting a lawsuit or a threat of a lawsuit is very scary for a lot of organizations and it kind of deters your creativity and willingness to go out into the marketplace when you get something like that so um i, I think that's an emerging trend that is also a pet peeve for me um so it's hard um for smaller organizations to break through I, those are both great. I, I think I probably am repeating myself, but I would just say a pet peeve in terms of being a lawyer and, and, and seeing people get hit with this is just not, not asking permission to just make sure that if you're using somebody else's content, you have permission to do it. Um, and to not, um, it, you know, this, and this is really hard because especially online, if you look online, there's so much copyright violation that it becomes normalized, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that, that you should do it. So um, always make sure you have permission to use others' content. Those are all great. And I'm also wondering, um, you know, on, in both of your different realms of expertise or areas of expertise as well, um, what are, Anita was sort of speaking to this a little bit, but what are emerging trends that you think, you know, our audience should know about, or also just maybe are something that like doesn't necessarily pertain to our audience, but like still is like, this is emergent and maybe there is a way that it will start to take shape where, you know, it will, you know, kind of very future thinking, what are, what are those emergent trends? What are those questions that you all are considering? Um, Anita, it's, you know, troll litigation, which I think, you know, is a very interesting one for sure. Um, John and Carolyn wondering, you know, what your thoughts are as well. I think maybe beyond just security, it's, um, you know, we've, we've, many of us, many organizations have gone to work from home transition due to COVID. Um, which has not been not been easy, and there's actually increased kind of cybersecurity risk by doing that. You know, our our employees and members of our organizations are just reaching into their drawer and pulling out like whatever Windows XP laptop they they have in order to get their job done. Um, but there's also I think there's there's opportunity in that too, in that you know a lot of um, organizations nonprofits might operate with a a focused kind of local or geographic mission, but there might be new opportunities that are um, new remote collaborations, new opportunities to think about a, a global impact. So I think um, thinking about a, what a, a global audience looks like from your, your organization is, is a, a interesting, trying to have a growth mindset in the, the midst of the pandemic. Um, and maybe the, the other thing I think for how technology intersects with the arts and, and culture is some of those new digital experiences. Um, I'm here, I've been seeing a lot of folks talking about, you know, uh, exhibitions through virtual reality or augmented reality. Um, Adam kind of touched on uh, non-fungible tokens or NFTs, like having virtual NFT galleries where people can still browse and appreciate um, art in a way that's, you know, from their house or from the living room. It sounds very weird and there are some very weird aspects to NFTs, but um, it's also interesting and, you know, kind of on the, the bleeding edge. Um, emerging trends in copyright law. I mean, I think Anita, Anita talked about the copyright small claims court. I think that's the, the general emerging trend of having a, an alternative to dispute resolution that is not uh, as expensive and time consuming as litigation. 
Um, I think there was a lot, you know, there's a long history behind that coming to fruition. And I think that could be really beneficial for, uh, you know, artists in particular, because uh, it's one thing to know that your art is being, or your copyrighted work is being infringed. It's another thing to have the wherewithal and the, and the funds, frankly, to file a copyright infringement lawsuit. So I think the ability to democratize that a little bit more and, and have a, a more efficient way of doing it, hopefully with this new small claims court, um, will, will end up being really helpful. Awesome. So um, yeah, I really appreciate all of all of um, your insights and also, yeah, just the for future thinking, forward thinking, um, look out for this kind of tips as well too. I mean, I'm, my brain is bouncing around. I've got like a pinball of ideas, but that said, we are at the end of our program here. I want, I'm going to um, invite Yen to do a share of her, her um, time lapse is the word. I keep forgetting the word today. Time lapse video of what she's what she's recorded. Um, there were also a few more questions in the chat. Um, we'll make sure to get those down and make sure that you get some answers um, from our uh, panelists and presenters um, as follow up to this program. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody for being here again today. We'll be sharing out this recording. A huge um, thank you to Nita and Carolyn for joining us and sharing their legal insights and expertise and John for his um, cyber secure expertise as well. And, you know, thank Thinking about people first technology too. Um, it's huge. And and big thank you to Yen also for making this creative and people first and capturing um, you know uh, what we learned. I learned a lot, what also we heard. And um, yeah, just a big thank you to everybody for being here too. We'll be sure to share these um, these videos and um, images out as well too. Um, which are great. And also, if you if you missed any of our previous programs, um, you can go to culturesource.org backslash calendar and see the recordings. Um, and feel free to join me for our hack session on um, not for profits does not mean not a target, which is starting literally right now. Um, and I have to go join the other Zoom call and host that as well. Got to build in some some space next time. But you know, we like the rush. It's good. Um, thanks, thanks again, everyone. And take care. Thanks so much.